we're going to discover here today is that this sanctuary that God gave to Moses is actually a divine picture or a divine miniature and model of the great plan of salvation. So let's begin by looking right there that is uh, right there in the paragraph that begins, the blank that unlocks the judgment is found, okay? So the key, that would be the first word, the key that unlocks the judgment is found in the Israelite sanctuary, okay? We've already spent some time looking at where the judgment comes in the great sweep of time, and we'll go over that a little bit more as we move on into the presentation, but you remember there was Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Little Horn, and then the... Judgment, that's right, followed by the second coming. And so here it says, the key that unlocks the judgment, this judgment that we're trying to discover, is found in the Israelite sanctuary. The cleansing of the sanctuary was a day of judgment for Israel, symbolizing the final judgment. The day of atonement. The cleansing of the sanctuary was a day of judgment, symbolizing the final judgment. The cleansing of the sanctuary took place on the day of what? Who remembers? The Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement, that divides into three words. At one meant or at one with. That's exactly right. Otherwise known as Yom Kippur. In order to understand the Day of Atonement, we must understand, at least in a basic sense, the purpose and drama of the Israelite sanctuary. There were two main services. How many services, everyone? Two main services that were carried out in the sanctuary. Certainly there were many ceremonies and rituals, but they can be roughly divided into two main categories. The daily service and the yearly service. Take notes and briefly describe both of these services below. Now, what we'd like to do is here's a picture of the, of the Israelite sanctuary, how it would have looked, okay? So what we'd like to do is sort of begin by, by taking an overview, a look at the Israelite sanctuary. And you can sort of see it there, the outer courtyard here where the large altar is, then the laver where the priest would wash before entering the tabernacle proper. The tabernacle proper, as we've already said, was composed of two parts. The first was the holy place, and there were three articles of furniture in the holy place. How many articles of furniture? For, as you walked in to your immediate left, there would be the seven-branched candles stick, okay? To your right would be the table of showbread that had 12 loaves of bread. And as you walked right up in front of you, there was a large curtain, and uh, that curtain separated the holy place from the most holy place. But just this side of the curtain was the altar of incense. The altar of incense. So three articles of furniture. Then as you would move past that through the, the heavy curtain there, there would be a single article of furniture, holy furniture there, in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And what was that? The Ark of the Covenant. That's exactly right. So this is kind of an overview, trying to understand this, this sanctuary um, from a biblical perspective. And what we're going to discover is that this was not something that God just invented to keep the Israelites busy. That is essential. God didn't say, well, you know, I've got this idea, and he, he started to invent this sort of capricious and arbitrary drama, and you go here and you do here, sort of a game, as though the Israelites were marionettes just going about this drama that had no meaning or significance. As a matter of fact, there was tremendous significance and tremendous foreshadowing in the Israelite sanctuary. And that's what I want to show you just now. Open your Bible to the book of Hebrews. Open your Bible to the book of Hebrews. Okay, that's in the New Testament. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 8. Okay, you'll get through the Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Then you'll come into the T's, Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus, and Hebrews. And we're going to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Now these verses are not in your study guide, but I highly recommend that you write them down. We're in Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. It says, now this is the main point of the things that we are saying. Paul's sort of bringing this to a conclusion. This is the main point of what we are saying. We have a what? A high priest who is seated at the right hand of the majesty in heavens. Who is that high priest, everyone? Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 2. A minister of the sanctuary, now I want you to notice this, and of the true tabernacle, which who according to that verse erected? Which the Lord erected and not man. So look at verse 2. It says that we have a high priest, but he's a high priest in the true tabernacle, the one that God erected and not man. 
What we're going to discover is that there are actually two sanctuaries. How many sanctuaries? Two. two. And earthly and uh, heavenly. And what we're going to see is that the earthly sanctuary was a model or a pattern or a copy or a miniature of the heavenly sanctuary. That's why the author of Hebrews says that we have a high priest who is in the true tabernacle, the one that God made and not man. Jump down to verse 5. Same chapter, look at verse 5. It says, "...who serve the copy and shadows of heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said..." This is God now speaking to Moses atop Mount Sinai. "...see that you make all things according to the what? To the pattern shown you on the mountain." So notice that. God here says to Moses, "...I want you to make everything according to the pattern." Now, when I was growing up, uh, frequently, my grandparents would babysit me. Um, I never had the privilege of meeting my biological father, and so my mother was a single mother, and, and uh, we lived there in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and it was very difficult for her to hold down a job and to take care of me and my younger brother, and so we'd spend a lot of time at my grandparents' house. And uh, I loved spending time at my grandparents' house because they had a beautiful apple tree behind the, the, the old house there, and I loved to climb up on the apple tree and hop up under the garage and just really enjoyed spending time with my grandparents. But every now and then, or oh, probably once every week or two, my grandmother would take a trip to the most boring place in the universe. It's called the fabric store. And uh, she... <laughs> She would have my, my brother and I go, well, I mean, you can't even get into trouble in a fabric store. There's just nothing to break there. There's just nothing to do. It's just a great big, you know, black hole of boredom. And um, uh, my father, or pardon me, my, my brother and I, we'd go to the, the, the fabric store there, and my grandmother would, would spend what seemed like hours going through these little shelves of patterns, you know, little white envelopes with ladies standing like this and guys standing like this, and she would buy these things, and it looked somewhat interesting, I suppose. And, and finally, after a, what seemed like an absolutely tremendous long period of time, we would eventually leave the fabric store, and we'd go home, and she'd bought, oh, I don't know, six or seven of these white packets. And I was thinking, oh, well, maybe there's something exciting in these white packets. And I'll, I never forget, the first time I ever saw her open one of those things up, she pulls it out, and it's brown paper. I was like, you've got to be kidding. We, we spend all afternoon in this silly store and you buy brown paper. And uh, what I'd see her do is she'd take those, those uh, fabric uh, sections, yards and different things that she had purchased, and she would lie them out, and then she would put these patterns on top of them. She'd put a what? pattern on top of them and cut them out. And if she cut everything out just exactly as the pattern prescribed, she could put together the articles of clothing that were be being advertised on the front of the envelope. Are you with me, everyone? Yes or no? So a pattern is an exact replica or a copy. A pattern is an exact replica or a copy. So God was speaking to Moses on top of Mount Sinai, and he said, Moses, listen to me very carefully. This is critical. You need to make everything to the exact specificity that I am spelling out for you here. It has to be exactly like the pattern that was showed you on the mountain. Had to be like the what, everyone? The pattern. See, the idea here is that Moses didn't just dream this up. Moses wasn't sitting around with Aaron and some of the other Israelite elders and saying, you know, what would be interesting? What could we do to keep all of these people busy? No, 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 no. God had revealed this pattern, this threefold pattern of the Israelite sanctuary that would eventually become Solomon's temple, etc., etc. So the sanctuary in the wilderness that was mobile became the temple in Jerusalem. Are we all clear on that, everyone? It always consisted of three major parts. How many parts? Three major parts. The outside was the courtyard, then the holy place, and the most holy place. So now we're in Hebrews chapter 9. Look at verse 23. Hebrews chapter 9. Same book, Hebrews 9, verse 23. It says, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Verse 24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with what? Hands which are copies or figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. So notice, what's the word that occurs in verse 23 and verse 24? 
copy or figure or pattern, depending on the translation that you're reading from. And so the idea here is that when Jesus Christ became our great high priest, he entered the true tabernacle, the one that God had built, and not the one that Moses built on the Sinai desert floor. Are we all clear, everyone? Yes or no? So the larger picture that we're trying to paint here is this. This sanctuary, this Israelite sanctuary, was a pattern, a copy, a model of the true tabernacle that's in heaven. If that makes sense, I want you to say amen. amen. So the point is that this isn't something that Moses dreamed up, not at all. This was something that God specifically commanded and ordained to incredible specificity and exactitude to be constructed exactly as he said. Okay, so far so good. In fact, really, that's sometimes why we find the books of Exodus and Leviticus difficult to read because Exodus and Leviticus is basically a how-to manual for the sanctuary. It's a how-to manual, how to conduct yourselves in the very ri various rituals and ceremonies and things that surrounded this sanctuary. And the reason that it's so specific, I mean, sometimes the details in Leviticus are almost laboriously difficult to read, is that God wanted them carried out in just a certain way. If that's clear, say amen. Now, you might be wondering why. Why? Is, is, is God an old fuddy-duddy and he, it, it's his way or no way? I mean, why was God so specific about this? What we're going to discover is that this sanctuary foreshadowed Christ and the plan of salvation. This sanctuary foreshadowed, what did I say? Christ and the plan of salvation. Now, stay, uh, keep your finger here in Hebrews because we're going to come back. I just want to show you one more verse to this effect, and it's in the book of Acts. So go to Acts. Chapter 8. In fact, maybe I'll show you two more verses very quickly to this effect. Acts chapter 8. Acts in the 8th chapter. And here we're going to find the... Let's see if we can discover it here. I think I said Acts 8. We're looking at Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. And here we find Stephen delivering his sermon. We'll talk more about this in just a moment. To the elders of Israel. So in Acts chapter 7, notice with me in verse 44 something very interesting here that Stephen says just before he's stoned. Acts chapter 7, verse 44. Stephen speaking. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness where? In the wilderness, as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. So, is it crystal clear that this, this sanctuary was built after a pattern that God revealed to him? If that's clear, say amen. amen. There are other texts that could be cited, but that hopefully gets us off the ground. Now go to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, last book of the New Testament. Revelation chapter 11, the last verse of that chapter. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19. John the Revelator saw the ark in the heavenly temple. Revelation chapter 11, what verse are we in? 19. It says, then the temple of who? God was opened where? Okay, according to that verse, where's the temple of God? It's in heaven. He says, then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen where? In his temple. Now, if the temple's in heaven and the ark is in the temple, then where's the ark? The ark is in heaven. It says, and there were thunderings and lightnings and noises and an earthquake and great hail. Here's the point. John, in heavenly vision, saw a glimpse of the heavenly temple, the real deal. This is the real McCoy. This is the one after which the sanctuary there on the Sinai desert floor was patterned. John looks into heaven and he sees the temple of God and he must have been, where must he have been looking in order to see the ark? He must have been looking where though? Which, which of the compartments? He must have been looking into the most holy place and voila, there's the ark of the covenant. Now this, this helps us to see that everything that was taking place there on the Sinai desert floor had a purpose. Had a what? Purpose. So now let's go find out what actually was taking place in that sanctuary? I've given you a place there, two places to sort of write out the, the two primary services that were carried out there in the Israelite sanctuary. And what we're going to discover is these were a foreshadowing of salvation, a foreshadowing of Christ. In fact, this sanctuary is all about Jesus Christ. It's all about who? Jesus Christ, okay? The first service is the daily service. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 9, okay? Go back with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Okay, Hebrews and the ninth chapter. Let's pick it up in verse 6. 
Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 6. The author of Hebrews says this, Hebrews 9, 6. Now, when these things had thus been prepared, the priests went always into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. They went how often, everyone? Always. I'm in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 6. Now, when, the, when these things had thus been prepared, the priests went always or often into the first part of the tabernacle, performing these services, verse 7. But into the second part, the high priest went, what's the next word? alone once a year, not without blood. Now that's a double negative, not without blood, which would mean what? With blood. With blood, exactly. With blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. Now, in verses 6 and 7, we have a very simple, simple, simple articulation here of basically much of Exodus and much of Leviticus, and that is that there were two primary services, the daily service and the yearly service. Okay, the which service? The daily and the yearly. Now let's just walk through the daily service, okay? We'll make this very simple so that we can all get our fingers wrapped around it. So you're an Israelite and you're living there uh, on the Sinai desert floor somewhere in the wilderness or perhaps later at the time of uh, one of the two temples that had been constructed and uh, you've committed a sin and you know it, okay? Your job then was to go get a lamb. A what, everyone? A lamb. Now, there were various offerings, and I want to just point out here again that we're simplifying this so that we all can get our fingers wrapped around it. There is more specificity, but we're going to keep it very simple here. So you would go get a lamb, and you would bring that lamb to the sanctuary. To the where? To the sanctuary. And you would bring it specifically to the gate that entered into the courtyard. There a priest would greet you. And your job was to take and confess your sin, specifically your sin, onto the head of that lamb. So far, so good, everyone? Yes or no? Now, what would happen then is that you would be handed a knife, and this must have been the most terrible, difficult part of the whole endeavor. You then had to take that knife and slit the throat of the lamb upon which you had just confessed your sin, and the lamb would be there writhing in pain as it would die, and uh, as it would die, blood would come dripping from its neck. The priest would then take a bowl, a receptacle, hold it under the neck of the lamb and catch some of the blood that was flowing out. Now, you as the sinner, guess what you do next? Nothing. You walk away. You're forgiven. Can you say amen? amen. You're forgiven. But guess what? The process of forgiveness has just begun. And that's one of the great glories of the plan of salvation. For us, for the sinner, you know, we kneel down in the evening and we say, Oh, Lord, today I got angry at my wife. Today I got angry at my husband. Today I cut somebody off in traffic. Today I wasn't totally honest with a workmate or et cetera, et cetera. We kneel down, we confess, and we get up, we say, Oh, there it is. Whoo, so glad I got that. Beloved, it's just not that simple from God's perspective. And that's what the sanctuary helps us to see is that from God's perspective, sin is sticky business. Sin is what, everyone? We've already said this before, but it bears repeating. The supreme object of God's love is sinners. But the supreme object of God's hatred is sin. And God has to perform this very difficult operation where he separates the supreme object of his love from the supreme object of his hatred. He has to separate them and still keep us alive and intact. The sanctuary is a picture of how difficult it is to deal with this thing called sin. And so you would have confessed your sin there onto the lamb. The lamb was then slain. The blood was caught. And then the priests would go into the holy place. Into the where? The holy place. And they would take some of that blood and they would put it onto the horns, these four horns that came up off of the altar of incense thus signifying that that guilt had gone from you. Follow this very carefully. The guilt had gone from you to the lamb, to the blood, to the sanctuary. Does that make sense? Let's say that again. So who did the guilt go from you to the lamb, to the blood, to the sanctuary? And you walk away forgiven, but God still has an issue on his hand, namely sin. It's important to recognize that God could not have just, you know, sort of said to Adam and Eve there in the garden, well, you know, you made a mistake. I really wish you hadn't done that. But, you know, uh, here's the sin. We'll just lift up the old rug of the universe, sweep it under there, and let's try again. When Adam and Eve sinned, and frankly, whenever you sin, whenever I sin, it's as though something tangible, something palpable comes into existence that God has to deal with. 
It's a little bit like this radioactive material that, that's created as a byproduct of all of these nuclear reactions and nuclear energies. That stuff is created and now it has to be dealt with, so too with sin. Something kind of comes into existence in a very real substantive way. And what God is saying here is that, sure, for you, you're forgiven. You walk away. You're cleansed. You are righteous in my sight now because of the slain lamb. But that doesn't make the sin go away. The sin has to be dealt with. Are we all on the same page, everyone? Yes or no? The other day, my little boy, Jabel, my youngest boy, decided to run around the house with a marker because he couldn't find any paper. And now I have a, a chair and a floor and a fireplace and a windowsill covered with my boy's marker art. And you might be thinking, oh, that's so cute. Well, it's cute-ish. Let's just put it that way. Cute-ish. And, uh, you know, I can reprimand my boy and I can spank my boy and I can say, you know, Jabel, we don't do those things. And, you know, there's a place for drawing, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, after he's received his punishment and he's running back around the house playing like a giddy little school child, guess what? There's still marker all over my house. Still something to be dealt with even after the sin has been, even after the punishment has been administered and even after he's off the hook. So too with sin. Are we all clear? And so you would confess your sin. This was the daily service. This was happening 359 days out of a, a Hebrew calendar year. There were 360 days in a Hebrew calendar year. And so 359 days, Israelites, and if you've read the Old Testament, you know the Israelites were very good sinners. Isn't that true? Right? Almost as good as us. And so that sin was going into the sanctuary, into the sanctuary, into the sanctuary. So far, so good, everyone? Which necessitated the yearly service. Now... The yearly service, well, before I get to the yearly service, let me say this. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Okay, the reason that that made sense, Behold the Lamb of God, was that the Jews understood exactly what he was saying. Oh, so he's the one to whom all of those lambs pointed. And in fact, you're still there in Hebrews. Look at this. You're still right there in Hebrews. Look at verse 4 of, of chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, very quickly here. Hebrews chapter 10, what verse? 4. four. It says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away what? Sin. It's not possible. Look at verse 11. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Do you see that, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, so was there, these lambs that were slain, the various animals that were slain in the Old Testament sanctuary service, did that blood ever take away actual sin? No. The significance of those uh, sacrifices was that they pointed forward to Jesus' sacrifice, which could take away sin, as the, as the uh, author of Hebrews says, once and for all. Okay? And that's really the author of Hebrews' point, is that he says, basically, I'll prove to you, because there are many Jewish Christians that were sliding back to these old sacrifices. He was saying, hey, 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 it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It, it's only as a reference or a pointing forward to the sacrifice of Jesus. And he says, I'll prove to you that it doesn't work. They have to do it over and over and over and over and over again. He says, if it's working, why do they have to keep doing it? Does that make sense? So all of those sacrifices pointed forward to Jesus. And when John says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, what he's saying is, here is the one to whom all of those sacrifices pointed. Amen? Amen. That's incidentally why you and I don't bring lambs to church today. God has, God, there is a sacrifice that has fully met all of the just requirements of a holy God. And that sacrifice was in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? It's totally useless now to offer those various sacrifices. Because God has been totally satisfied, His justice has been satisfied with the sacrifice of the true Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen? Okay, so then, we move to the yearly service. You have the daily service, day after day, the sin's going from the sinner to the Lamb, to the blood, to the sanctuary. So into the sanctuary, into the sanctuary, into the sanctuary. Well, at the end of the year, you got to clean the sanctuary up. Just like I got to go clean up that marker that my boy's done all around my house. And what happens here is that the high priest, the who? The high priest would go alone into the most holy place with the blood of a goat that had been killed. 
Now, we don't have time to go into all of the details, but you can read it in Leviticus chapter 16. I'll give it to you in a brief overview here. It's Leviticus chapter 16. You'll want to write that down. The high priest would go in with this blood, and he would take this blood, and he would apply it to the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. That is to say, the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, where the two cherubim were, and that bright, shining light, the Shekinah glory, and he would apply that blood there as a symbol of the cleansing of the sanctuary. Sanctuary on the day of atonement, which means this is the day that the sin had been going in, 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 and now the sin is going to go out and be cleansed by the blood of Jesus, or what pointed forward to the blood of Jesus. So far, so good, everyone? And, and that was called the day of at one meant because this was the day when Israel would once again be clean, be cleansed ceremonially, ritually in the sight of God, and God would be at one with his people. If that makes sense, say amen. So the daily service, sin is going in. The yearly service, sin is going out, and the sanctuary is cleansed. Okay, now go back to Hebrews chapter 9. Look at it again in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 6. These verses should make much better sense now. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 6. It says, Now when these things had thus been prepared, the priests went always into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. Verse 7. But into the second part, who went? And how did he go? Alone. How often? Once a year. And what did he have? Which he offered for who? Himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. Verse 8, the Holy Spirit indicating that this was the way into the holiest of all, which was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. This is, of course, a reference to uh, Moses' tabernacle. Okay? Now, very fascinating here to note something. Jesus was not only the Lamb, Jesus was the High Priest. High priest. You've got it. That's why we say the whole sanctuary points to Jesus and to the salvation offered us in Jesus Christ. Amen? Very powerful. So once again, I just want to underscore here, God was not just giving them something to keep them busy in the, in the, in the wilderness. He wasn't just saying, well, you know, what am I going to do with all these people? You know, I've got to keep them busy, got to keep them out of trouble, got to keep them off the streets. No. He was trying to show them salvation and how it works. And so here's Christ and he's the Lamb. In fact, you have Christ all over the sanctuary. Christ is the bread, and the Holy Spirit is the, is the seven-branch candlestick that's constantly burning, the prayers of the saints, the incense wafting up over into the most holy place. You have the, the, the cherubim there and the throne of God, the Ten Commandments. All, it's all about Jesus Christ. Very powerful. And so Jesus, our high priest, entered into the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Didn't we read that already? Didn't we read that? Let's see. That's in 8.2. Pick it up in verse 1, actually. 8.1. This is the main point. We've already read this, but it should really register now. Now, this is the main point of the things that we are saying. We have a high priest who is seated where? At the right hand of the throne of the majesty. Where? In heavens. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. And so... Jesus entered into heaven itself as our great high priest ministering in the heavenly sanctuary. And that is one of the great themes of the whole book of Hebrews. In fact, what was happening was many Jewish Christians were backsliding into the old system. They were backsliding and going back to the old offerings. And the author of Hebrews, who I believe to be Paul, basically was writing to them saying, No! They had a covenant. We have a better covenant. They have a temple, we have a better temple. They had a high priest, we have a better high priest. They had a sacrifice, we have a better sacrifice. It's all about Jesus. There's no point to be going backwards. We should be going forwards with the Lord. Okay? Now, three compartments. Those three compartments were not arbitrary. They foreshadowed the threefold ministry of Jesus as lamb, as intercessor, and as carrying out judgment. Okay? Very important to, to notice that. In fact, if you wanted to divide this up, I'd write this right there on your little outline. The plan of salvation as depicted in the sanctuary service delivers us from the threefold power of sin. Sin has a threefold power on your life and on my life before we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, that was the equivalent of dying in the courtyard. He was the lamb that was slain in the courtyard. In the where? In the courtyard. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he delivers us from the penalty of sin because he paid the penalty on the cross. Can you say amen? The wages of sin is 
death, and Jesus died our death so that we can live His life, okay? And then, in the second compartment of the sanctuary, power is given. We say power because you have there on the left the seven-branch candlestick representing the Holy Spirit that was always burning, that marvelous flame. On the right, you had the bread. The bread symbolizing Jesus and particularly the Bible. Isn't that what Jesus said in John chapter 6 and 7? He said that I am the bread of life. Okay? And you have this analogy here of Jesus as the bread and the Word as the bread. And so we have the Holy Spirit. Watching must-see TV does not get you power over sin in your life. But prayer and Bible study and spending time in ministry and, and with the Holy Spirit, that does get you power in your life over sin. So the cross gets us victory over the penalty of sin. The wages of sin is death. The holy place gives us the power to overcome sin. But even if we have victory over sin in our lives, and I want to praise the Lord Jesus Christ that He can give victory. Can you say amen? I mean, praise His holy name. He doesn't just say to the alcoholic, you're forgiven. He gives the alcoholic power to stop being an alcoholic. Amen? He doesn't just say to the abuser, I forgive you. He says, I'll give you the power to be kind and to be gracious to your spouse or whoever you're abusing. God promises victory, not just forgiveness. Amen? I mean, what good would that be to bring only forgiveness and not victory? Beloved, when, when our heart is transformed and when our life is changed, we don't want to continue to wallow in the vomit of sin. We don't want to continue to wallow in the manure of sin. We want out. Amen. This is why it says in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21 that they will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. It doesn't say that he will just save them from the penalty of their sins, but that he will save them from the sin itself. Are we all together? And so power, but even if we have victory over the power of sin in certain areas of our lives, we still live in a sinful world. We are still surrounded by the presence of sin. Are we all together on that? And so on the Day of Atonement, it symbolized that final judgment when sin was wiped out of the sanctuary and all of God's people were clean, the sanctuary was clean, God, of course, has always been clean, and now God and His people are at one with one another. And so the cross from the penalty, the intercession of Jesus in the holy place from the power, and his judgment ministry in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary from the very presence of sin. Can you say amen? amen. Very powerful. I wish I had more time to go into that, but I just don't. Turn the page there in your study guide. So the key that unlocks the judgment is found in the Israelite sanctuary. The cleansing of the sanctuary was a day of judgment which symbolized the final judgment. Think of it this way. Your sin could not be taken out of the sanctuary if it had never gone in. Does that make sense? The only sins, follow this carefully now, the only sins that were cleansed on the Day of Atonement were the ones that had been confessed one of the other 359 days of the year and had gone in. Does that make sense? So if you had been rebellious against God, if you said, well, you know, this whole sanctuary, shmanctuary thing, no, 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 no. At the end of the year, when God is at one with his people, the Bible says you are cut off, symbolizing the final judgment. That's why the people in the Old Testament, the Israelites, were outside of that sanctuary, why the high priest was in the very presence of God. In fact, we're told that, that uh, in, the, in the garment that the high priest wore, there were little pomegranate bells around the hem of his garment so that they could hear him moving around in there doing his various things because he was going into the very presence of God between the cherubim. And it's said that if he had any unconfessed sin in his own life, he'd die on the spot. And they'd tie a rope around his leg. And they'd drag him out. Because you couldn't go in there. Only the high priest could go in there because only Jesus can go into the presence of God on our behalf. And that was pointing forward to that. So this was, a, this was serious stuff, beloved. Are we all, this wasn't religious games. This was serious stuff. And so it symbolized the Day of Judgment because nothing could come out of there that hadn't first gone into there. So far, so good? And so we go to the back page. The imagery, ceremonies, and drama of the heavenly sanctuary pointed to Jesus in fact, Jesus was the very heart of the sanctuary. Jump down there to the three compartments and the three phases. The altar represented the cross. The holy place represents the intercession and the mediation of Jesus. Most holy place, judgment. Okay, everyone see that? And so you have there, if you want to write that in, deliverance from the penalty, deliverance from the power, and deliverance from the presence. Let's all say that together. Deliverance from the power and the 
penalty, or pardon me, you're getting me wrong here. The penalty and the power and the presence. That's exactly right. Excellent. Now, let's go to our next study guide. Next study guide, let's pick it up. You can read a whole lot of this on your own. We're going to jump right to the second page. Okay, right to the second page. Second study guide. Here we go. We'll put this up again tomorrow, but I just want you to see how these visions lay right beside one another in very beautiful, systematic fashion. Okay? Daniel chapter 2. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the second coming, right? Head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, long legs of iron, and then divided uh, Rome down at the bottom, and of course the stone would strike the image and the whole thing was smashed to smithereens, and that stone grows and becomes a great mountain. That's Daniel 2. In Daniel 7, we review and enlarge, remember? And so we see the Babylon beast, which is the lion with eagle's wings, followed by Medo-Persia, represented by the bear that was raised up on one side, three ribs in the mouth. You might be thinking, what does this have to do with the sanctuary? You're going to see in just a moment. Greece was the four-headed leopard, of course, moving very rapidly, very fast. Then pagan Rome, which was that horrific beast with how many horns? Ten horns. And then out of those ten horns came a little horn. And then what happened after that, remember? Yeah, we saw that sequence three times in Daniel 7, didn't we? Rome, and then little horn, and then judgment. And then we went to Daniel chapter 8, and we saw a ram. And the ram represented Medo-Persia that became great. And then the goat represented Greece, which became very great, the Bible says. And then there was that little horn representing both the pagan and the little horn phases, the papal phases of Rome. And it says that it became exceedingly great. Right? So, so the, the ram is great, the goat was very great, and the little horn, the Bible says, was exceedingly great. Some people have tried to say the little horn in Daniel 8 is a, is a Seleucid king by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. But it's very hard to reconcile that. Antiochus Epiphanes was a man who ruled for 12 years in Syria. And, and here you have this progression from great, Medo-Persia, to very great, Greece, to exceedingly great, this little horn. Antiochus was nothing compared to uh, Alexander the Great, much less the whole Macedonian empire. And so whoever this is, it has to be very great in the scope of history. Has to be what? Actually, the Bible says exceedingly great. And so we see here exactly what we would expect in Daniel 7. Pagan Rome, the little horn. And the next thing that we saw in Daniel chapter 8 was the cleansing of the sanctuary, which corresponds with what in Daniel 7? The judgment. And the very next thing is the second coming. So you have these prophecies that lay down every time God is reviewing and then he's enlarging. Okay? Now go to Daniel chapter 8. The Lord Jesus is going to be with us. We've got to hustle, but we're going to do it by His grace. Daniel what chapter? Eight. Here we go. Daniel chapter 8. A lot of these you can fill in here actually on your own. We've already been over quite a bit of this as a matter of fact. Jump down to the bottom of page 2. Jump down to the bottom of page 2. But first look at Daniel chapter 8. Remember, Daniel hears this little horn speaking blasphemous words, making war against God's people, God's son, etc. In fact, I think we have that slide here. There it is, right there. The little horn attacked, remember these four things? God's people, God's son, God's sanctuary, and God's truth. Remember, remember that transition we saw in Daniel chapter 7? It was these predatorial beasts, but in Daniel chapter 8, it switches to a ram and a goat, which were what, what kind of beasts? Clean beasts sanctuary beasts. And so immediately the mind is drawn to the sanctuary and then you have there in Daniel chapter 8. Look at it right there. You're there. Daniel chapter 8 verse 14. And he said to me for 2,300 days then the sanctuary will be cleansed. We all see that? Okay. Daniel basically wanted to know how long is this garbage going to go on? This little horn making war against God's people, God's son, God's sanctuary and God's truth. And then he overhears two angels talking and one says how long? And the other says 2,300 days. Then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Well, now you know what it means. The sanctuary will be cleansed. The final judgment. Now, look at this. Verse 15. Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I was seeking the meaning, and suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. This is Gabriel. Verse 16. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Look at that word, understand. I would underline that in your Bible. Understand. Verse 17. So he came near where I stood, and when he came I was afraid, and I fell on my face, and he said to me what? Understand, son of man, for your vision refers to the time of the end. So the vision refers to when? 
Time of the end. Question, did Daniel understand the vision? No. Gabriel comes to explain it to him in two times. I want you to understand. I want you to understand. Now, he tries to explain it, but Daniel actually ends up fainting. Jump down to verse 26. Daniel chapter 8, verse 26. Gabriel speaking. And the vision of the evenings and the mornings, that's the 2300 days, which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. Now, look at verse 27. And I, Daniel fainted and I was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one, what? Understood it. So did Daniel understand it? No, 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 no. So here's what happens. Then we transition to Daniel chapter 9. We're at the bottom of your study guide on page 2. Bottom of your study guide, page 2, putting the pieces together, Daniel 9 and the explanation of the vision. We all there? In Daniel 9, I'm reading from the study guide. In Daniel 9, we find Daniel seeking to understand the troubling vision of Daniel chapter 8. He seeks the Lord in prayer and supplication. Verses 4 to 19 record one of the most powerful and beautiful prayers in all of the Bible. In the middle of this prayer, the angel Gabriel comes to answer Daniel's prayer. The answer is found in the form of the angel explaining the meaning of the troubling vision of Daniel chapter 8. The vision of Daniel 8 had to do with the pompous words and the wars of the Antichrist, the little horn. These words and wars called to session the heavenly court for the purpose of judgment and the vindication of God's people who had been wrongly accused by the Roman church state. The terrible record of this power is doubly compounded by the fact that it carried out all of its persecutions and blasphemies in the name of, you say it, God. That's exactly right. In the name of God. Turn the page. So here's Daniel. Daniel does not understand the vision, and so he begins to pray. What does he begin to do? He begins to pray. He says, oh, God, I don't understand the vision. I need you to explain it to me. He begins to pray this marvelous, powerful, powerful prayer in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9. In fact, you can actually see some of that prayer beginning in verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through the prophet Jeremiah that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Jeremiah had said in his scroll that... Israel would go into captivity. Judah would go into captivity for 70 years. Daniel had been in captivity for almost 70 years at this point. And so he's seeking. He's doing what you and I should be doing. We should be studying our Bibles. And he says, I understood it. Now look at verse 3. Then I set my face toward the Lord, my God, to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord, my God, and I made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love and with those who keep his commandments, we have what? sinned. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even from departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. He goes on and on. Jump down now to verse 11. Yes, all, what's the next word? All Israel has transgressed your law. And the whole prayer goes down through verse 19. Basically, it's one of the longest and most beautiful prayers in all the Bible. Daniel is pouring his heart out to God. He's saying, God, we blew it. We know now why you let the Babylonians come and destroy our city and take us here into captivity. It's because we disobeyed you. We broke your covenant. Oh, God, have mercy on us. In Jeremiah, you said it would only last for 70 years. The 70 years is almost up. I'm an old man now. I came here as a boy. Please. And at the end of that prayer, guess who comes back? Gabriel comes back. Look at verse 20. Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, who? Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man who, everyone? Gabriel, Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. Verse 22, and he informed me. And I want you to notice the first thing that Gabriel says, the first words out of his mouth. Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Exact. That's what we'd expect. Because we end Daniel chapter 8. Does he understand? No, he doesn't understand, but does he want to understand? And he's pouring his heart out to God, and Gabriel shows up, and the first thing he says is, I've come to help you understand. Understand what? The vision that he had just seen of these 2,300 long years. Remember, day in Bible prophecy is a year. And Gabriel comes and says, I'm going to help you to get it. And don't faint this time. <laughs> okay? Now, you're still there in your study guide. Okay, can you keep up with me? Can you do it? We're on page three. You're doing a great job. Take a breath. Here we go. Top of page three. You're getting it. I can tell you're getting it. 
It is imperative to remember that a day in end time Bible prophecy actually represents a yeah. year of actual literal time. Not only are beasts and horns and women and water symbolic, so is time in end time prophecy. As we learned last lesson, the vision of J Daniel chapter 8, the 2300 days extends all the way down to the distant future, according to the NIV version, Daniel 8, 26. As the angel returned to explain the 2300 day vision, and here we are, he begins by telling Daniel of another time period. This period would last 70 prophetic weeks or 490 prophetic days. That's what you'd write in there. 70 prophetic weeks or 490 prophetic what? Days. Now, how did we get 490? 70 times 7. So far, so good. Piece of cake. See, you're getting it. According to the angel Gabriel, this was a time period specifically allotted to the Jewish nation. Now, let's go back to the Bible. I want you to see this. Verse 23, I'm in Daniel 9, 23. We're going to get this by the grace of God. Here we go. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, Gabriel speaking to Daniel, for you are greatly beloved, therefore consider the matter and what? Understand, understand the vision. Two times he says it. Understand it, understand it. I really want you to understand it. Okay, and here's the explanation, verse 24. First words out of Gabriel's mouth when it, has to, when it, when, when it comes to the actual explanation. Verse 24. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. How many weeks? 70. 70 are determined for who? Your people and your holy city. Who's Daniel's people? Israel. Wasn't he just crying out and saying, all oh, Israel has sinned. And now Gabriel shows up and says, 70 weeks are for your people and your city. What city would that be? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Okay. So let's go to our guide here. The angel Gabriel returns. He begins by telling Daniel of another time period, a period of 70 prophetic weeks. This time period is the key to understanding the 2300 days. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, it's a piece of cake. Daniel didn't understand the 2300 days. He's asking for understanding. Gabriel comes back and says, I'm going to help you to understand. Sit down, Daniel. Put your schoolboy's cap on. I'm going to help you to understand this vision. And the first thing he says is, 70 weeks of this are for your people. So far, so good? Pretty simple, really. Seventy weeks are determined for your people. Now, there's a list of six things here. You can write them all down later. They're all in verse 24. Every one of these comes from verse 24. He says, 70 weeks are determined for your people. I'll come right back to that slide. You've got, you've got six things need to be accomplished during these 70 weeks. And they're all right there in verse 24. Look at it. Seventy weeks are determined for your people. Number one, to finish the transgression. Number two, to make an end of sins. Number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Number five, to seal up the vision and prophecy. And number six, to anoint the most holy. Okay? All of them right there. You can write them in. Every one of them comes from verse 24. Now, so far, does the vision make sense? Okay? Gabriel basically shows up, says, I'm come to explain the 2300 days. Seventy weeks are cut off for your people. Seventy weeks are cut off for the Jews, in which period of time six things have to happen. How many things? Six. Now, by the way, by the way, by the way, you know for a fact that a day in Bible prophecy equals a year. Because 70 weeks would be about how long? In real time. Like a year, not even a year and a half, right? 52, day, 52 weeks in a year. So 70 weeks is a year and a half. Can all of that happen in a year and a half? No, 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 no. In fact, we'll see that in just a moment. No way. The prophecy itself demands that we're talking a day for a year. A day for a what? A year. And think about it from Daniel's perspective. He's already been in captivity for almost 70 years, right? If, if Gabriel shows up and says, woohoo, only 70 weeks to go, a year and a half, this would have been cause for celebration, not cause for concern. He says, 70 weeks are cut off for your people. 70 weeks for the Jews, six things to accomplish. If this makes sense, I want you to say amen. Okay, now we're still there in our study guide. Judgment fell in 70 A.D. when Jerusalem was sacked by the Roman army. Verse 25 gives us a starting point for these time prophecies. Now let's go back to this slide. This is what we know so far. Okay, this is what we know. The 70 weeks are 490 years, and he says 70 weeks or 490 years was the time allotted for the Jewish nation. That's what we know so far. Okay, any questions about that? That's pretty simple. Now look at verse 25. Okay? Know therefore, and what's the next word? There it is again. I mean, that word comes up again and again in Daniel 8 and 9. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until who? 
the Messiah, who's Messiah the Prince? Until Jesus Christ, the word Mashiach, Messiah, and Christ, Christos, are the same words. They mean anointed. Okay? So know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the anointed prince will be, notice what he says here, seven weeks and 62 weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Now, 62 plus 7 is what? 69. Okay, so basically here's what he says. 70 weeks are cut off for your people, and then he gives us a starting point. From the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the time of the Messiah is 69 weeks. If that makes sense, say amen. Now remember, the, the, the Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed at this point, and what's going to happen is, is that Babylon is going to become Medo-Persia, and then you can go read all about it in Ezra. What would happen is, is that God would, and Nehemiah, it's so powerful, God moved upon the heart of the king there in, in Persia to let the Jews go back to their homeland and rebuild the temple. Isn't that powerful? And he says, from the going forth, when that decree came, and it came from a man named Artaxerxes. You can read all about it in Ezra chapter 7. Write that down. Ezra chapter 7. He say, is his name really Artaxerxes? It really is Artaxerxes. So Artaxerxes issues a decree, and he basically says to the Jews, get out of here. Go on. I'm letting you go. Go back and rebuild your temple. Go back and rebuild your land. Go. go. You're out of here. And, and if you need anything, you can pay for it out of my treasury. Powerful. God moved mightily upon the heart of that, that pagan king. He said, get out. And so the children of Israel began to go and rebuild their city, rebuild their temple. And when that decree went forward, it was in 457 B.C. It was the sixth, it was, pardon me, the seventh year of Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes came to power in 464. 464, move seven years this way. 457, he says, go, go, go. So that's what you'd write in on the line right there. It says, that date is 457 B.C. Gabriel then explains after 69 weeks, or 483 literal years, by the way, just do the math, right? It's very simple. 490 years is 70 weeks. How many weeks? Okay, so then if we're talking about 69 weeks, we would just subtract how many years? Seven years, which would be what? 483. So he says, hey, 70 weeks are cut off for the Jews, and from the time that that decree happens until the Messiah is 69 weeks. Okay, so far so good. It's actually pretty simple. So here we are. Let's put it on the board here so you can see it. We've already been to that slide, so we go to the next slide. Here it is. 457, you move forward 483 years. That brings you to exactly 27 AD. Brings you to 27 AD. Brings you to what? 27 AD. You write it right in right there. Boom, 27 AD. What happened in 27 AD? Jesus of Nazareth was baptized. He was baptized. You can read it in Luke chapter 3. I've given it to you right there in your study guide. And in Luke chapter 3, Luke was a fantastic historian. He said that this happened in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. The 15th year. He began to rule uh, uh, con uh, congruently with his father in 12 AD. You move 15 years. That brings you to 27 AD. Jesus was baptized in 27 AD. Jesus was what? Baptized. Baptized in 27 AD. And he was anointed, according to Peter, it's right there in your study guide in Acts chapter 10, he was anointed by the what? The Holy Spirit. Remember the Holy Spirit descended upon him? And he heard that voice saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now I want you to think about this. This is so powerful. Gabriel comes to explain the vision. He says, 70 weeks are cut off for your people. 70 weeks for your people. Okay, 70 weeks. From the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Daniel saying, yeah, mm -hmm, got it, got it. Daniel, for 483 days, or prophetic days, literal years, then the Messiah will come. The one you're looking for. The one we're all looking for. He's going to come. And sure enough, right on time. In the fall of 27 A.D., a man named Jesus of Nazareth walked away from his father's carpenter's bench. And he walked down to the River Jordan. And John saw him. And he said, 
Look. It's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I imagine everybody... And here comes Jesus of Nazareth. Walks down into that water. Speaks to his elder cousin, John. John was his cousin, six months older. He says, John, I need you to baptize me. Right now. John says, no, you've got to be kidding. I have need to be baptized by you. Suffer it to be so for now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. The Bible says that John put him down in that water, whoosh, baptized him. And the Bible says, as he was coming up, a voice from heaven, my beloved, behold my beloved, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit came upon him. And in Acts chapter 10, Peter says he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. By the way, that's what, whenever you anoint something with oil, that symbolizes the Holy Spirit. The oil is the Holy Spirit. That, that, we're, we're, you know, when I go to anoint people, I anoint them with olive oil. Jesus was anointed with the real deal. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. Now I want you to look at Daniel chapter 9 as we close this. Look at Daniel chapter 9. 70 weeks, verse 24. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand, Daniel, that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, 457, until Messiah comes, the anointed prince, there will be seven, 69 weeks, seven weeks and 62 weeks, the street will be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Beloved, how did Jesus know when to leave his carpenter's bench? How did he know? I'll tell you how he knew. He knew the book of Daniel. When Jesus is baptized in Mark chapter 1, and we'll look at this tomorrow night, when Jesus is baptized in Mark chapter 1, do you know what he says? The time is fulfilled. Mark chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Jesus is baptized. He says, the time is fulfilled. What time? What's he, what, what's he the time is fulfilled? How did he know that it was time to stop sawing and go down and be baptized? How did John know that it was time to start preaching in the wilderness of Judea? They knew this prophecy. There was a set amount of time the Messiah would come. Now, that's just the beginning of this prophecy. It's just the what? It's just the beginning. But let me tell you what, beloved. Sometimes people say to me, well, how do you know Jesus is the guy? I'll tell you one of the ways I know. He perfectly fulfilled this prophecy of the Messiah that was given some 500 years before his time. Baptized anointed by the Holy Ghost. And that, look, look at this, look at this. That just gets us through the first 69 weeks of this prophecy. Do you see that, everyone? That, that's just the first 69 weeks. That just gets us to 27 AD. We still have another what? We still got another week. Well, what happens in that week? Well, we'll see you tomorrow night.